think the volume is about right. Does that sound a bit loud back there? Macy, am I deafening? Okay. All right. Sorry, I am jacketless. This is totally inappropriate for me to come up here, but I had my big winter coat and I had my hood since we were freezing over there, so I should have switched out outfits uh, to introduce our illustrious speaker, but uh, I am uh, I'm in inappropriately attired. My apologies. But good to see all of you here. I'm glad that we've uh, able to get a, a, a good number here tonight to enjoy this, and uh, I've been looking forward to, to seeing this for, for many years now, hearing about this individual that uh, has, has served in this area uh, in, in the, uh, the ancient years. So uh, it's good to have him here with us, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing his presentation tonight. Let's give a warm round of applause to Mr. George Evans. Thank you, Mr. Burnett. Uh, I don't know where to start. <laughs> no, I, I, when I first gave this, I had a script someone had prepared for me. And I don't have one tonight. I just, I write down the names because I forget people's names. Like the first one, let me see if I can go ahead. Anyway, this is a picture from when the statue was dedicated. And first name I have to remember, the President of the United States was Grover Cleveland. And he gave a speech accepting it because the statue was a gift from the people of France to the people of the United States. So there was a speech, I don't know who gave it, giving it to him, but Mr. Cleveland, or President Cleveland, gave the accepting speech. And the, so this is the big celebration. We didn't have fireworks in, it was 1886, so they had gunboats and firing the guns and making a lot of noise. But the sculptor was Bartholdi, and he had a French flag over the face. And then he was up in the crown so that he could drop that when the president finished. And he had a boy down at the bottom to give him a signal when the president finished because he couldn't hear him. We didn't have loudspeakers either, I guess. I wasn't there. <laughs> but anyway, the president paused. The boy gave the signal. Bartoli dropped the flag, and then all the gunboats started sh <laughs> shooting. And that's a good way to end politician speeches. <laughs> anyway, this is the workshop. I wanted to give a start. As I said, I don't have notes, but I did want to mention that how did we come to get the statue? You know, it was at the end of the Civil War when the French people who appreciated our freedom, and at the end of the Civil War, they felt very bad about what had disrupted and broken apart our country. I hope there are no real <laughs> Dead. Uh, I used the wrong word, but you know, we we're really convinced the South should have won. <laughs> but anyway, they they were encouraged by the end of the war, and there was a meeting in, you know, a dinner meeting, uh, and the man that held it was named Edward de la Bouille. Pardon my French, but <laughs> but he was a history professor and a politician, and he felt, you know, that we should, the French should give something to the United States to appreciate the end of the Civil War, and it was to be from the people to the people. So at that meeting, he was suggesting we do something, and the, the uh, 
the sculptor Bartoli was there and he had always dreamed of pr making a huge statue. He tried to get the French or the uh, Egyptian government to make one at the entrance to the Nile River, but they weren't willing to do that. So this was his opportunity and he suggested that is what would be and it was it happened that way. So that's how we came to have this statue because of the end of the Civil War. And these people wanted to express to the people of the United States their happiness at that. But this is the workshop where the statue was made. Now, Bartoldi did not know how to make a statue like that. He started with a little sculpture. And then he got a French architect to tell him how to do it. Well, the French architect was Eugene Emmanuel Violette Le Duc, known as Le Duc. But anyway, he suggested that it be a masonry pier all the way up and then fill the voids with sand and attach the copper to the pier against the sand so it would hold there. Now, have you ever, any of you been to the statue? I know a couple have, wow. I had never been there before I was sent there to work on it. But anyway, uh, I usually, if you've been there, if you've been inside and see, it's a great experience being inside and seeing it. But we wouldn't have had that if it had been built the way Monsieur Le Duc wanted it. But fortunately for us, unfortunately for him, he died. And then they had, <laughs> they had to find another way to build it. And Bartoli went to uh, Gustav Eiffel, who was a bridge engineer. And he came up with a way of building it which is magnificent. I give him such credit. You know, it's 305 feet to the top. And the winds in New York are something else. I've been there. But anyway, he designed it so it moved with the wind. And it moves up to like five inches. At least that's what they told me. I didn't experience that. We didn't, but we did have a hurricane came through New York while we were working on it. Fortunately, I went to France or to uh, China for the feast that year, and I was in China when the hurricane came through. But uh, anyway, Eiffel really was a brilliant person, and there had never been anything like this. Later on, he did the Eiffel Tower from things he learned from doing this. Because bridges in those days were just masonry arches over a river. But anyway, you can see the statue, the arm and the shoulder. And the name of the company that did the actual work was Gaget Gautier et C, which is the name of two people, Gaget and Gautier. And they made little replicas of the statue and they sold those as souvenirs before time because they had to raise the money. The French raised the money to build the statue, but it was up to the United States to build the, uh, let me go back one, build the, the foundation, the base. The base is 151 feet high, but we didn't have the design and we didn't have the money to build that and it took a long time. But they were selling these little replicas uh, to raise money. Now I always wished I'd see, been able to see one or have one. And before we moved to Texas from Ohio, someone moved into the unit next to ours and I met over and met them and talked to them and the fella had one of those. I really wish I'd been able to get him to sell it to me. But it's beautiful. I made a photocopy, put it on my printer and copied it, but 
Anyway, people on the streets back when they were trying to sell them, somebody would say to the other, because it had the name of the company, Piaget Gautier SC, and people would say, did you buy one of those gadgets? And that's how I'm told we have the word gadget in the English language, or American language, anyway. But anyway, the French raised the money and they had their part ready. It was supposed to be given to us on the anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, so July 4th, of 1876. We weren't ready. We didn't have the base. We hadn't raised the money. So it was 10 years late. And it was actually dedicated on October 28th of 1886. But because we hadn't raised the money and Joseph Pulitzer, Pulitzer Prize, was the uh, publisher of the New York World newspaper. And he was upset that we hadn't done it. So he printed articles and he came up with the idea of getting the kids to donate pennies to help pay for it. And then through that, he embarrassed big companies so that they would contribute lots of dollars. And we did it and it was ready about 10 years and a little late. But anyway, this is the shop where it was made. And then they had the head, as you see, if I can. And that's the structure at the middle that was on display in Paris in, I think it was 1872. So they were ready. And they shipped over the head. Let's see if I can. Oh, there's the structure. Same picture, but you see the rest. And then that's the scaffolding they, they built to be able to put it all together. And if you remember this scaffolding, that's in the 1870s. And you'll see what we did in the 1980s later on. Uh, I give credit to the fellow who designed the scaffolding. At the time, it was the largest freestanding scaffolding ever built to include the, enclose the statue when we did it. And then this is the foundation. This was concrete. And the foundation was, this was at the time, the largest mass pour of concrete ever done up till that date. But we had the concrete foundation and then they clad it with granite. And I think my next picture shows, yep, there they're putting the granite on. And notice the lady there with the umbrella thinking she could direct the rest of the workers. <laughs> You always find that, right? <laughs> so this is the way it was being erected in 1886. I have to watch because sometimes I mix up my centuries. And I'll mention 1986, but it was 1886. But that's as they were erecting it. Now, the, the actual copper that came over was in 200 wooden crates that came on the French ship Isère that brought it to the United States. And this is the way the statue was when we came upon it in 1984. That's when I started working on it. And a number of people has asked me, how did you come to have that job? Well, I have to tell, especially having heard Mr. Meeker's sermon today, God brought the job to me. At the time, I had been a part owner of a good-sized architect engineer firm, and they decided they'd do better without me. 
Well, they separated me, and eventually they just lost the business, and they never were as as successful as we had been when I been, had been there. But I was known. I had been working 30 years in architecture and engineering. I'd done a lot of big projects, and I was known. So I started looking for a job, and I didn't want to leave my hometown. It was Clark Summit, Pennsylvania, a town of 5,000 people. And we had two big architectural firms there, ours, which was smaller than the other one. But I, I had worked for the other one as a student in, high, in college, and they knew me, and they knew my reputation. I didn't want to work for them, but I didn't want to leave town. So I tried other companies in our area. I even went as far as Philadelphia, but I was not finding anything. Having been in the position I was in, people didn't want to hire somebody like that. So I finally called up this other company, and I, I had designed the building we were in, and then our company had come apart, and this other company bought the building, and were in a building I designed. And they had taken the receptionist too, so she had been my receptionist before. But I called up and asked to talk to the president. I didn't know anybody knew I was out of a job, but everybody knew. But anyway, I called up and asked for Jack. He was out of town. So uh, she said she'd give him the message. He got back that afternoon had her call me, and she called me up and said, Jack wants to see you at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. So I said, okay. I was there. I pulled up into the front of the building. I designed. He, pulled, he came around the building, and we parked right next to each other in front. We get out of the car. He says, hi, George. I said, hi, Jack. He said, do you have a resume? Well, I didn't know anybody knew I was was looking for a job, but I said yes, and I handed it to him. So we walked in, sat down in the conference room, and he read through it. And he's, he was an older, excuse me, Irishman with a good sense of humor, but he read through people I'd worked for, including the church, and he made caustic comments about everyone. And then he said, well, let, let me tell you what the job is. It's a very prestigious project the restoration of the Statue of Liberty. And he said, within two seconds of when I got the message that you'd called, my partner in New York called me up and said, you gotta get me somebody to run the statue job. And he said, you know, I just got your message, I mentioned your name. And it felt like Larry, his partner, was trying to reach through the phone and kiss him. <laughs> well, I was, you know, there. He offered me the job. He said, when can you start? This was like on a Thursday. I said, well, Monday, you know. I was, I'd been out of work for 28 days, and I'd been given 30 days severance, so Monday. <laughs> anyway, thir on Monday, I started working for them, that company was designated as the managing architects and engineers for the restoration of the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island. I worked on Ellis Island too, it was a smaller job. But anyway, uh, I forget where I was. Anyway, oh, what he, he had said that I, I, you know, within two seconds, he got the, the phone call from his partner. Well, they both knew me. They both, both knew my reputation. And I was hired and went down there. But uh, I know God put those two phone calls together, the two messages, and they were very happy. Now, they asked me how much I wanted. 
I told them what I'd been making as an owner and fine. And they sent me right out to the Cadillac dealer to have them get me a car. So I, because I was 100 miles from New York City. So I spent my week in New York City uh, at the statue r managing and running it. And I was the one that had to approve everything that was done. And they didn't have much of a scope of work because all they knew was it was going to fall down. And that the structure had to be replaced. But they knew nothing else. So then it was up to me to come up with, would we do this, would we do that? You know, we put in three elevators. Uh, you know, everything was a question, what will we do here? And it was me who was there to do it. But I was the manager. I was overseeing. And the Park Service had the responsibility, but the, they, the government was, wasn't paying for it. So again, it was being built with public subscription. And they set up aside the, uh, the, uh, the foundation for the restoration of the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island. And they got in Lee Iacocca as the chairman. And Lee Iacocca is a brilliant man, and I worked with him, it was fine, but he said right away to the Park Service, what's the scope of work and what's the budget? They didn't have one. <laughs> so he said, well, at the time we had 240 million Americans. He said, if we got a buck from each, that's $240 million, that's the budget. And that's what we have to raise. And then set apart, that's part of what I did was establish what the scope of work was. But now to start, the, I said the structure was damaged. Uh, the, the structure that Eiffel designed, you saw those pillars that came up, but then there were and that was steel, but there were steel members coming out from it to hold up what became what's called puddled iron. And there was a framework like a lady's dress. No, what well, a dress form. To, and that's what this structure was like. And there were 1,200, well, they were called puddled iron because it was before there was wrought iron or whatever. They puddled it into a form. And so all these, there were 1,200 bars, two inches by three quarters of an inch. And iron isn't the greatest thing. It wasn't steel. But in 1886, what did we have? The tallest building in the United States at the time was 10 stories. So for this to be 305 feet is equivalent to about 30 stories. So much bigger than the tallest building. But all of those, so we'll get to the, maybe the next picture will show, no. Nope. I'll get to the framework in a minute, but this is the way it was. And you came by boat, of course, and you walked on the sides of this grassy knoll there to get to the back of the statue where you entered. So I remember, I'll show you a picture then. We replaced the grass with brick and granite paving on nine inches of concrete. And where the people are walking here, we had a, a grassy, and there were our trees there too. We replaced the trees and it's a much better entrance the way it is now. It helped go all, except that what we did was a much big, better an improvement on everything that was there. <laughs> but right in front, you see there's a statue. There were five statues of the five people that had so much to do with it. Bartoli, Eiffel, I 
have it written. Oh. Well, I can't remember the. But anyway, Emma Lazarus wrote the poem, Give Me Your Tired, Your, and so forth. So there was a statue of her and Joseph Pulitzer at, at the this back. We moved them up and had them nearer the statue. But there again is the way the statue was when we came up. The outside was fine. We didn't have to do much to it. You'll see what we did have to do later. But it is a magnificent work. And it was said that Bartoli designed the face to resemble his mother. So, oh, this is the one. You see the spot there. There were a number of places where uh, water had done damage and it had rusted the iron. And so there were places where the rust was coming through. And one of the things you'll see in a little bit in 1935, they had to do work on the nose because that had become damaged. And actually, in 1935, the statue had a runny nose. <laughs> so you, if you see here, the all those <laughs> iron bars were had the copper was attached to it with water, copper saddles that fit over it, and then there were copper rivets that held it together. And a number of those had, the rivets had popped, leaving holes, and that just allowed more water to get in and caused more damage, and it would have fallen down if we hadn't done it what we did at the time. Now there's the nose, which had been repaired in 1935, but it wasn't a good job. I think it was WPA, but anyway, no, it wasn't. But, <laughs> but we we had to refinish the nose, and that's basically the largest thing, other than the torch itself had become damaged, and we replaced it. And you'll see that in a minute. Well, there, you see there are problems. Uh, there's white in different places and black. Now, the statue was copper when it was built, just copper colored. And it was the thickness of two pennies. So it was kind of thin, but it was strong enough to do it. But they, they couldn't cover the outside. And copper develops what's called a patina, it's the green color and it's a protective coating that keeps it from other damage. So the outside was fine, but the government in all its wisdom decided the inside wasn't. So they coated the whole inside with coal tar, was black. And then naturally the government, as they do everything, they painted it inside in green every so many years. So we had many, many coats of green paint and then the black coal tar, which we removed. And we'll get to that in a bit. But you see the, oops, sorry. I don't know what I did. Oh, there we go. But the black is the coal tar that seeped out. And the white is bird droppings. <laughs> it's a very great place for seagulls to land. So up at the top, there's a crown, and those are windows here. And then these are, there are seven uh, spokes or arrays, which represented to the sculptor the seven continents and the seven seas. Now, they had damage, and we fixed those, but unlike the whole rest of the statue, which had an iron 
structure. These did not. And we found that the side piece was bronze and the bottom and top were copper. Now the bronze was fine, but it had to be cleaned up. But so the copper wasn't bad either, but we, we kept those, but we had to take them off, redo them and clean them up and put them back. So you see here the way they showed damage. I mean, it was 98 years old when we started our work on it. So that's the torch and the flame. The flame is what was all the problem that caused all the damage. And you can see here, when it was built, was just about the time that Edison invented the electric light bulb. So the government decided it should be a lighthouse. So they got around the flame, let's see if this will show it. Oh no. Anyway, around the flame, they cut, I think it was eight holes like that big around, and put a light bulb in there. Well, if you know Edison's original light bulbs, it wasn't going to be a lighthouse. At the time, lighthouses produced their light by burning coal or whale oil, or the better thing was mineral oil. So a light bulb wasn't going to do it. You couldn't see it any distance. But they cut those eight holes, put a light bulb in it, and then later on they cut eight more holes. So we yeah, had 16. People couldn't see. So they hired then Gutsam Borglum. Anybody know the name Gutsam Borglum? He was the one that did Mount Rushmore. So he was good for Mount Rushmore. He was not good for the statue because what he did, oh, let me just finish this and get back to it. The bottom of the flame, it was called the acorn. That was completely filled with rust. So we had to cut it, take it down, and it being filled with rust, it was very heavy. You see a picture of the fellows. I can still hear them as they loosened it and then a whole bunch of men holding. And when it came loose, I can still hear them go, oh, because it was so heavy. But we replaced that part. That's the other thing we did on the outside. And this is just the way the, the robe or cloak of the statue is and all these different things. And imagine we had to do a structure that followed the folds. Here again is a picture of the bottom of the uh, cloth clothing, and you can see again all the white spots which came from our friends, the birds. And then this is the foot. Nobody gets to see that. It's a beautiful thing. It's great work, but only because we had the scaffolding could we see it and get this picture. But also, this is a chain, still made out of copper. But originally, Bartoli had the idea of having the left hand hold a broken chain, indicating freedom from slavery. And in the right hand was the torch, which was the, the actual name of the statue. Anybody know the actual name? liberty enlightening the world. And that's what the torch was to show, liberty. But that's what our job is, enlighten the world. Anyway, uh, the man, Labouillet, who had suggested doing something in the first place, told Bartoli, it shouldn't be holding the chain. The chain should be shown broken at its peak. And nobody ever gets to see this. 
only because we had the scaffolding down. But they replaced then the left hand holding instead of the chain a keystone shaped book which has July 4th, 1776 on it. And they called that, sorry, I have to look to see if I can find the name, uh, Tabula and Sala. That's Tabula, Tablet, but it meant evoking the concept of law. That's what the book was to be because there is no liberty without law. Now that's a picture of the foot. If you recognize the fella in the hard hat, that's me. But no, you won't find other pictures or people will never get to see that I was up there every day overseeing it all. And then this is the way the stairs climbing, the, I think it's 324 steps to get up to the stop, the top. And when they built it, the stairs were made of aluminum cast, cast aluminum. But then outside it was this uh, railing, which everything was then painted green. So I hope you'll appreciate that we didn't replace it with the green paint. We had to replace all the steps. They were bad. But we didn't have the green railing like that. We were doing it all. The railing is stainless steel. Now this is a picture looking up into the statue. And you can see here it's the wrong button. Sorry, I pushed it more than once. Uh, no, there we are again. It's hard keeping your finger on the button to get the, the uh, arrow work. But all of the, these are the iron bars. You see all of those? They're, Average between four and five feet on center both ways. So there are 1,200. We had to replace all 1,200. And we did it. Memory will tell me. Three at a time. So we had people go up and disconnect them. I think it was four, I'm sorry. But it was one on the one side, one on the back, one on the other side, and one on the front at four different elevations and take them down at six o'clock in the morning and then put them in a shop. We built a shop for that on the island, but then either steel or iron workers, they called themselves, or there were better ones who were really qualified doing museums, quality work. They did the harder ones, but we had a union so the other union re insisted they do so many of them. And the easier ones we had them do. You'll see where, where we did that. But they had to bring them down in the morning, make a new one, and get it all prepared, put it back up 6 o'clock the next morning, and take down another four. And we did that. Now 1,200, that's 300 work days. I figured it took quite a while to get all that done. But we also had the problem of the paint and the coal tar. You see the black coal tar underneath where the paint came off. We had to really figure out how to get that all off. And it was a woman park service employee who suggested we freeze it with liquid nitrogen and the paint all chipped off and fell. Now the coal tar was another story. We tried all kinds of chemicals to get it out. I had a graduate uh, chemical engineer work for me. Uh, 
we did a lot of testing, but we, we couldn't do it with uh, chemicals. Kept trying it and see their the copper. But we finally found a painting contractor who used, on the bridges in New York, he used baking soda, blasting it off. So you get it, the uh, coal tar came off blasting. We had tried all kinds of other things. Blasting it with sand, that did too much damage. We tried corn, tried a number of different things. But the baking soda was soft enough so it wouldn't damage the copper, but strong enough, not being blasted, to get the coal tar off. Now this is some of the structure that you see, one of those copper saddles. And this was a, actually a steel angle that comes out from the column that went up. But we had all that to redo. It was in really bad shape. And you see here, those are rivets and a copper saddle. And you see the white. That's where the rivets had popped out. And the, it was so that the copper skin was no longer being well supported by the iron framework. And every one of those places, water would get in and cause more damage. But the basic cause of the damage was by the flame that goes on board them. I didn't ever get to that, did I? Anyway, I'll show you the flame and see what he did to it. And that did left so much water in that the structure had become rusted and would have fallen down. Now, you see the World Trade Center in the background. This is what I saw every day. We had to get there by boat. I'd never been there before I was sent out to do it. But this was an old pier, or an old wharf that uh, was no longer in use, but all of our materials had to come on this pier. So we cleaned it off. And as I said, we had nine inches of concrete plus brick and granite on the new walk. That concrete, we had to bring six concrete mixers over to the island on barges. Everything came by barge, but came up this so we could pour the concrete. Now this is the beginning of the scaffolding. Uh, the guys who do the scaffolding are amazing. You'll see them walking on it. You see the uh, fellow up here carrying a piece? As I mentioned, that was the largest freestanding scaffolding job ever done up to that time. And one of the rules from the Park Service was none of the pieces could be any closer than 18 inches from the skin. And that was quite a job to get it all done. And then we had planking that had to be moved so they could get those rivets out to work on the iron framework. And you see the stairs. Not only did I have to climb the stairs on the inside, I had to climb those on the outside too. Um, but to see the iron workers doing the scaffolding, I could climb the stairs, but I wasn't ready to work out, walk out on the scaffolding. But here's the way it was when it was all enclosed. Now, one of the things, we had to bring the, uh, the flame down to re redo it. And so they have a two-sided crane up there at the top in order for it to drop one down. And on the other end, it had to have a, a counterweight so that it wouldn't tip over. So you see the two 
arms of the crane up there. And down at the bottom, they built this ramp to be able to move things around there. And there's that crane up there. Now you see the uh, flame, which that's that's on board when cut it up into all these little pieces, and it was curved copper, which he just had then in little strips, and then flat pieces of glass. We weren't able to make curved glass at that time uh, when he did it. That was in 1916 that we did that. But all of those joints then, we didn't have good caulking, allowed water to come in, which came down, laid on the iron bars, and uh, caused all the rusting. So there they're attaching the hook from the crane to lower that down. And there's the counterweight up at the top. Now this was July the 4th of 1918. <laughs> 1887, when the, all this was in the midst of it, it was halfway through our project. But this is Lee Iacocca, and next to him is Walter Cronkite. So this was a big news event. So there's again the way the flame was, which was really deplorable and caused so much of the structural damage. There it is there. They had to take the top off and get the hook in. Nobody, had, there were no plans of the statue. We didn't know how much it weighed, how you could hook it up, and everything was done on the best guess. So there they're hooking that up. Notice the man standing on the. That was something. No, no, right. OSHA wasn't really in effect, I guess. Who ran that project? <laughs> <laughs> so there they are with the, uh, the flame just getting it off and ready to lower. And there it is, just starting. Now, this was a big news event. All the television uh, Companies were out there flaming, and the rule was you couldn't have more than 25 mile an hour wind and still drop that down. So they're all out there getting their cameras set up, and they started dropping it down. The wind came up. It got to be 95 or 25 miles an hour, and they dropped it quickly and got it down to the bottom. And all these, so there we had, we had prepared a base for it and set it down. And there are the cameramen who were very upset that they didn't get good pictures. So there's where it was when we set it. Now, we had to also move it from there on the base and put it on, the, on another uh, structure we built for it on the ground. And there's where it was. You see the steel structure and then it's sitting there. That's the top of the torch and the flame. And once it was there, they gave me the job of designing a crate to put it in and send it to Pasadena, California where it was in the Rose Parade. But we had no drawings, no nothing, no information. So I had to get up and measure that top part. And what I did was stand here, hold a two by two up with a tape on it, and had two men that measured it out from the base and made a drawing of it for me. Now there's back to the top where we took the flame off uh, just to see we had the hole left. And notice, oh, I'm sorry. I don't know why I go 
said to me so much. But notice the finger, how perfectly the sculpture was. You know, the fingernail, everything was done so well a hundred years before. So we put a cap on the top so we wouldn't get water in it. And of course that had to be copper. And now you see the hand where you saw the finger before, but these figures, all the workmen that was done to make it in the beginning was so well done. Now there's the crate I designed and we had it covered with plexiglass because it was being shipped by Allied Van Lines out to the airport where the Flying Tigers flew it out to California. And I had to work with both of them. So that was when we were bringing the top of the crate down over the thing. Now I had taken the dimensions, figured out, because for the Flying Tigers, the crate couldn't be any more than eight feet in one direction and 10 in the other. So it was like 13 feet across the diagonal. And I had to know that it would fit, but I had confidence. <laughs> but I was watching very carefully when they brought that down. And I had allowed three inches clearance. It worked. They had three inches. We had, we had to do it on the diagonal. So these are fellows from Allied Van Lines fastening it down. And we also designed lighting to go into it. So in the Rose Parade, you could see it. You'll see a picture of it in the daytime. It happened to be the day we were leaving on the barge that we had terrible thick fog. And again, the television cameras were there. And they interviewed me standing there. Uh, but with the fog, when the barge came over, it had to go to Brooklyn to a little pier. It hit the pier. We were concerned that it would be all right. So I had to not only design it to fit, but I had to have the crate was on shock absorbers. So there was riding on the roads on a truck. It would be safe. And they had me follow it in, a, in my car and direct the truck so he wouldn't go too fast. It was shaking. And we had to do it going across the George Washington Bridge down the, Pens or the New Jersey Turnpike. And we had police escort, New York City police in the city met by New Jersey State Police at the middle of the George Washington Bridge and then the turnpike police on the way down. Well, on the way down the turnpike, I'm following the truck and controlling the speed. And there's two police cars, one in front, one behind, and a third one running alongside. And all of a sudden he forgot me and he pulled me over. <laughs> well, I gave the truck driver pull over. So we we're all stopped there. And then I had with me a representative from Allied Van Lines in my car with me. He said, I mean, I was upset. <laughs> he said, let me handle it. So he got out and told the guy who I was and what I was doing. And then they let us go. <laughs> but the lighting was very nice. And well, as we were driving through from the pier out to the airport. We're going through on a main street in Brooklyn. And we hadn't announced that this was happening, but people could see it. And it just the streets became crowded with people watching such a first time anything from the statue of Alexis statue. But this is a shop in Orange, California, where they were building the, the uh, float. And this is John Robbins, who's an architect for the uh, Park Service. 
So I had to work very carefully with him and everything. But he was able to be out there overseeing them doing the float. I didn't get to do it. I was too busy in New York. Anyway, there we have the plane on the float. Notice there's a picture of the face of the statue, and that's all done in seeds. Everything else had to be floral, either seeds or petals or whatever. But look how nicely the uh, light from the flame shows up. So it was going very near Ambassador College. But this is the original flame, but all of these other pieces are all done with flowers, flower parts, or seeds. And we're back inside. This is a fellow doing the blasting of the paint off with liquid nitrogen. And that just fell, just it worked out so well. And you can see the <coughs> topper after the re removal of the uh, coal tar, but there's coal tar around. And these are the structural pieces that we had to replace all of. And this is a fellow doing the blasting with the baking soda. Now, it was a hose within a hose, so the inner hose was blasting it from a reservoir, blasting the baking soda to get the coal tar off. But the outer hose was to suck up the baking soda and, you know, remove it so we didn't contaminate. But that, w that worked fine if we're a flat surface, but it's not at all a flat surface. So the baking soda was all over, and it would leak out any little opening in the skin and come up, it would rise, and go up all the way to the top. So at that point, because of the baking soda, we had a blue Statue of Liberty. Now, we also wanted to seal all the joints between sheets of copper. You see the rivets there. All the sheets were connected that way too. But Dow Chemical uh, came up with a silica scaffolding that we could use. And we couldn't do it on the outside because, you know, you'd see all that, all those joints. So we did it on the inside, which isn't the best way to call, but it worked. So we had no infiltration of water after we had that done. Now this is the original uh, pier that was made of uh, steel. And then all the other pieces, as I mentioned, were iron. <coughs> and just at that time, the space agency developed a new paint that we were able to use. It was a zinc-rich paint that we could use for the structural steel parts. And it was so well, you know, it did a job, such a job. You could cut the paint and it would, the zinc would migrate over and seal itself again. So it was, it just came at that right time. And at the same, well, here's working on those pieces. We had to unbolt each one. <coughs> it's not the best of pictures, but you can see a man chews at his legs as he's working to take some of those off. And there he's taking a piece of the <coughs> iron bar off. And then they brought it down. You can see how it was. And then it's not a, easy to see, but they used uh, thin, regular steel as a mold, as a template to make a new bar. And they 
can see it better there. And then here they're making the new bar out of stainless steel. So it wouldn't rust or corrode and should last a thousand years or so. We'll see. But there, they had to use heat in order to shape it. And this is one of the craftsmen that did all the difficult bars. Now, when they were all done, because of all the beating with hammers and stuff, it was affected. So we hooked up, it seemed to me it was like 10,000 volts of electricity through each end of the bar and passed that through. And I can't think of the word now, what it did for the steel and the old ones so that it restored its temper. But we had to get it at 2,000 degrees. So the fellow there is holding a machine which reads the temperature. But you really didn't need that machine because the steel starts out as their gray color or stainless steel. And then it turns red and orange. And when it hits yellow like that, it's 2,000 degrees. But we still had to read the temperature. And this is inside where there used to be concrete stairs. And we built one of the elevator shafts right there. That's what this picture is showing where that was. Same here. Now this is up at the uh, crown where they're taking off one of the old uh, rays that came out from it. So I had mentioned there were seven of them. Somehow I think the picture is not the same. No, you, you can't see on here, but where they took one of those rays off, you see all the green patina of the copper, but where they removed it, oh, it's just at the edge there. Uh, just goes beyond the edge of the screen. But you see the copper color that was left because they've been up there for 100 years. This is where they took, I mentioned the acorn off the bottom of the uh, torch. And I, as I said, these guys were holding it. And when they got it down, I could hear them going, oh, you know. Now, this is in the shop we made for the Frenchman. And we did find a company that had seven French iron workers. The way they, the, the process of beating the copper to the shape we needed is called repousse, French word for it beating copper, I guess. But they had to do the same, these guys were doing the same quality of work in France, and we brought seven of them over. And only the one would speak English, so I had to communicate to him and the others in English. But he was not the foreman. So they had a, a big celebration for the 99th anniversary of the statue in Washington, D.C. There was a big concert. They had three tenors. They had other things going on there. I was there. It was very interesting because we're in this, the Lincoln Center, and I had people coming up to me and saying, hello, Senator. <laughs> I didn't explain. <laughs> but anyway, that the, only the foreman of the French group was there, and I was the only person he knew. So he spoke to me in English. I mean, he wouldn't do that on the job. <laughs> he didn't have confidence, but he felt good enough with me that he would do that. Now, these are the French workers working on uh, the new 
pieces. That's the new porch or the new frame, rather. And they made first a half scale model. We had no drawing, so we had to measure what had hunkered down from all the damage that had been done and pictures from 100 years before. So they were able to come up with the size and make it in plaster of Paris. And then the hats, the half size, and we painted it with gold paint. Because Bartoli's original concept was it was plain sheets of copper, no holes in it, and then gilded. So that's what we wound up doing. And we had lighting, and this was for a test, to test how the lighting would be on the gold uh, flame. And here they're making the full size, which is made of, it's, they have the uh, plywood and other wood framing, and then the uh, plaster of Paris. And they're working on it, measuring from the half size to the full size. And those are the Frenchmen. Notice the T-shirt with Coke on. At the 99th anniversary of the statue, Coca-Cola came out with the new Coke because it was founded when this, the same year the statue was originally built. So they said 99 years of the statue, 99 years of the Coke, it's time for a new one. They came out with a new Coke. It didn't go over. But they, they made a, a uh, can't think of it, a commercial for television, and they gave all the workers the T-shirts with Coke on it, and they had them all there. They wouldn't allow me to be part of it. I wasn't. I guess I was management, but everybody else was there and made part of that. This continues on. After they had accepted the uh, model, full-size model in plaster of Paris, then they put steel pieces on to replicate it so that they could come and beat the copper, the new copper, to match the other side of the, of the steel pieces. They didn't want to beat it against. plaster. You can see them doing that. This is another piece of the flame that had to be done. That's, that was a wood form to beat the copper against. Oops. And that's the piece. This fellow was one of the best craftsmen from France and made that piece. Now, there were seven Frenchmen they were five of them were members of the French Guild, like a union that were qualified to do this work. Two of them had not passed the test, and they had to make a museum quality piece to be admitted to the guild. So those two made a new piece. They also all made their own tools. So each one was. Uh, their own. We'll see the pieces they made later on. Maybe I have a story, but that's the scaffolding. When we got the new uh, flame up there, which you'll hope you'll think it was much better than it was before. But notice the date. It's 1985, December 30th. We had to have it done by December 31st so that we could start taking the scaffolding down. It had taken four months to put the scaffolding up, so we allowed that in the schedule. We got it down in two, so we were not in a real problem. There you see the gilded flame, scaffolding coming down, and it's just there. But look at that flame. Except for the lights in here, 
You could see the gold, but we'll see another picture of that. There we are. But it's not better than the old plan. And there we are with the scaffolding gone. Now you see the brick and granite paving down the middle, so you walk right up the middle to the statue. There it is, looking out from the statue. Now, it's a new flagpole we put there. I don't like to be too critical of the Park Service, but they wanted a 100-foot flagpole, and they had their regular flag, so we got a flagpole to meet their specs. What they didn't tell us was they had a regimental flag, oversized, that had been presented to them by some military department. And they hadn't told us, and they couldn't fly that flag on this flagpole, nor were they willing, probably we weren't willing either, to put a different flagpole. Well, it would have taken a different base to be able to take the wind pressure. Now that's the pier where all the boats come to bring passengers or bring people to visit the statue. And it used to just be a pier. But on top of the pier, we have the wood that is, I wanted to bring in a piece of it. It's called Bangazi wood from Africa. And it weighs 70 pounds a cubic foot. In other words, it doesn't float. I love taking chips of it and being able to throw it out in the water and see it sink, you know. But anyway, we put a new roof over where the people stood because they're there rain or shine. So we had where they would stand waiting for the boat <coughs> on their way out under a roof. And the roof <coughs> is made of this Bangazi wood but then covered with copper. Now that's the new stair we put in with stainless steel railings and sides. And that's better than the green paint, don't you think? Now these are, these are big trusses that go across to hold the statue together. And then this is an elevator shaft where they pull. Now there's the big elevator. And I think you get 20 people in there. And you get 20 people from different countries. And the elevator, as they put it up, if it were off a little bit from meeting the floor, it wouldn't, the doors wouldn't open. Now, to get an elevator repairman to come out on a boat, get him from somewhere else, come, get the boat, come out and fix it, those people were stuck in the elevator. And they would be banging on the door and hollering in different languages. I don't know what. Now, this is an emergency elevator. Uh, it's two feet by four feet. But if somebody had a heart attack or some other ailment up inside, they would have to be brought down in that. So we had to find a way to thread that up all the way to near the, the upper landing. <coughs> and did I mention about Nancy Reagan? Well, anyway, President Reagan was the one that dedicated this new statue. He was on. Governor's Island pushed the button and turned the lights on. Uh, but Nancy Reagan wanted to have one of the windows taken out in the uh, crown so that she could lean out and have her picture taken for television. Nobody wanted her to do that, but she told him it was going to be, and he made sure it was. And I had to have every, nobody wanted that. But we had the Park Service, the FBI, the Secret Service, 
and another military organization wanted to check everything out. They're afraid of terrorism. We hadn't had the first, you know, the World Trade Center yet, but they were concerned because it's a, a prime place for a terrorist to do something. So I had to escort all these people in there. And uh, anyway, they, she had to ride up in this little elevator with two Secret Service men. And as I said, they're really in shape. They're the guys that run along with the president's limousine. Well, when I'm taking them up, we get halfway up the stairs, and they, the lead one said to me, did we stop, catch our breath? Well, I was used to going up and down there. I said, yeah, we can stop. But so, so then he said to me, I see why you're in such good shape. But that was 40-some years ago. Was it 30-some years ago? Jeez, no. I was in better shape then. Now, this is how the looking through the structure, all those new and, and only copper, no green paint, no coal tar, and all of these pieces were in stainless steel. And I think I pushed twice. There's one of the pieces the men made to enter the build wonderful uh, workmanship there. I, I'd taken my great-granddaughter out to visit. They asked me to take her out there just a year or so ago. But I wanted her to sit on there like I sat on the real one. She didn't want to do it because she pointed a sign out on the wall. No standing on the feet. So I said, you won't be Standing, I'll just set you down on it and then we'll take a picture and take you off there. She didn't want to do that. Now this is the other piece that's a replica of the face. Excellent workmanship. These guys were really terrific artisans. Now we took the old plane and put it in the lobby as you enter the statue. And I had a, I had a lot of fights on this tour. The Park Service wanted it so that the uh, tip of the of the flame was pointing to the door as you came in. And I told them, that's wrong. It's the other way up there. It should rep just be the same, replicate what's there. And we had these big fights. I won. So there it is on display the right way. So if you go to the statue, you can see that. Now this is the ladder going up the arm. And it's closed off so that nobody can do it. But I had to go up there multiple times. And uh, we put lights all around the base of the plane and they kept burning out. And we had a guy from the Park Service go up every day. I think there were 14 lights, but he would make a record of which ones burned out every day. There were floodlights in a little case. Well, the man who was in charge of light bulb design for General Electric came out. He had a doctorate and whatever. And he told me they were burning out because of vibration from the wind. Wasn't so. And I had to argue with him. That's not going to break the film. I said, what it is, it's shock. Because the and wind is bad up there. You know, the statue moves like five inches. So up to there. So I said, it's the wind hits the enclosure around the floodlight hits it and it breaks the filament. Well, he did a lot of testing and then he finally agreed. It was shock, it wasn't a vibration. So they, they designed a rubber gasket to go around so it wouldn't hit it and break it and then it worked. Now that's the old plane on the base of the crate I designed and that's me just so you remember me. 
And this is the big celebration. We did have fireworks in 1986. I guess that's it. So.